My name is Richard Briso. I am a retired mathematician and computer scientist from the communication security establishment. And uh, over the last 30 years, I've had a passion for collecting cryptologic and clandestine artifacts. Well, basically, it is a device that uh, started appearing in the 1920s. Uh, in fact, the patent that led to it is 100 years old this year. It was 1918. And it led to a device like this, uh, not quite the original one, which was a little bulkier and prone to some faults. Uh, but anyway, it led to this machine, uh, which the Germans adopted in the 1920s and as they rearmed Germany. Its purpose was to encrypt, encode uh, plain text messages into ciphertext. And the ciphertext, hopefully, would not be breakable by any enemy of Germany. Well, as innovative as the German Enigma was in terms of its own technology, which is basically electrical and mechanical, it saw such widespread use, and of course with World War II being what it was, it was vital for the Allies, and especially Britain, to try and break this Enigma machine. Now, this particular machine is a four-rotor Kriegsmarine uh, Enigma, and it is probably the ultimate challenge for uh, Britain, because those using this specific model were the U-boats in the Northern Atlantic, and of course they were creating havoc. They were a pain in the rear for the British. So it was vital to break their messages, not just for the fact of breaking them, but when you did break it, U-boats typically reported their position in the Atlantic. So knowing that, you could, you could act upon it. The one thing about the historical uh, perspective for the Enigma, in the 1930s, all of the German military used a three-rotor Enigma. And in 1942, this particular one shows up. Now, in the 1930s, there's only one country that's paying attention to Germany and its use of Enigma. It's the Poles. And uh, through some innovative analysis, they are able to break and exploit Enigma. So they are breaking Wehrmacht, uh, that's the Army and the uh, uh, Air Force, they're breaking three-rotor Enigma traffic for those two. Well, that's probably one of the most important questions that I have whenever I give Enigma talks is I usually show the one challenge on the one side, which is a four-rotor Enigma and the ultimate solution, which is what the British and then the Americans developed, known as the bomb, to break these messages, is I ask, what does it take to go from this challenge to here? Uh, if you want to break an Enigma message, what do you need? And the question I require is in the question, and that of obviously, in order to break an Enigma message, you need an Enigma message, as you just suggested. So Britain establishes a whole infrastructure to intercept collect and forward Enigma traffic throughout the world back to Bletchley Park so that they can break messages. Yes, Canada played, in fact, a very uh, key role in collecting and forwarding traffic. Even here in Ottawa at the experimental farm, there was a small couple of huts that developed for the sole purpose of intercepting enemy wireless, especially German Enigma traffic, and to forward that back to the UK. Yes, and in fact, uh, there were British individuals who, after the war, um, you know, Churchill thanked everybody who served there, um, and thank you for your services, and good luck in finding yourself the next job. So a few of them, including William Tut, came to Canada, did extremely well in terms of his academic career uh, at Waterloo, University of Waterloo. And uh, he was famous for having helped uh, break the Tunney, Enigma, uh, Tunney uh, German machine that the high command of, in Germany was using. Well, uh, 
since I spent a career in mathematics and computational mathematics, uh, computer science, uh, analyzing our own Canadian communications in order to secure it, and as well the flip side to that, looking at uh, uh, countries of interest to Canada in terms of maybe exploiting their traffic, uh, that interest in the mathematics and understanding how things work. But I think the real spark came after I visited the National Cryptologic Museum at Ford Mead, Maryland. They opened in the early 90s, and my first visit, I had this fascination about Enigma, and uh, as luck would have it, within a couple of years, I had an opportunity to buy one from Denmark. Well, that's a million dollar question. Um, there's a bit of luck. Um, it goes back to that question of how do you go from that challenge to the ultimate solution. Uh, obviously, you need brains. You need uh, uh, that talent that can uh, look at traffic and assess there's something not quite right here or notice something very interesting as you decrypt the first few messages as you get into a system. Uh, just as an example of how you keep a good thing going for the British is that for the three-rotor Enigma, they were able to break it in the early parts of the war, and there was a post in northern Africa that the operator typically reported nothing to report. Nothing to report. Well, there's nothing very interesting about that, but that ultimate solution, which is the bomb, relied on the availability of what are called cribs, knowing a bit of plain text that matches with the ciphertext. So if you're able to intercept this operator who says nothing to report, you intercept his Enigma message, and you know he's saying nothing to report, that's gold. The Allies were under strict orders not to go anywhere near this individual so that every day he keeps a it would keep on encrypting, nothing to report. You give that to the bomb, it breaks the settings, and you're able now to exploit everybody else on that same network. Okay, in terms of what the bomb was, uh, basically that was the creation of Alan Turing. If you saw the imitation game, you saw uh, the early versions of what would have been the bomb. It was meant to break Enigma messages based on knowing a bit of a plain text uh, that belongs to a specific position to an intercepted Enigma message. Now you have to be really have a sense of awareness of where to put that crib and derive information and give that information to the bomb. So those bombs recovered answers sometimes that weren't correct you'd have to keep going and until you derive something that you could further analyze and verify, ah, we do have the answer. So the imitation game in some ways cheats on that, that the first recovery happens to be the right one, but you had to do more work. The movie kind of short circuits that and makes it look like they got everything they needed. Yes, it was strictly electrical. Uh, it did a lot of things in parallel, massively parallel for the time. So it had, you hear a lot about parallel computing these days, so it had these early notions of it there. But the true first computer is the other machine you mentioned, the Colossus. Colossus, with over 1,500 vacuum tubes, paper tape that would roll off at about 50 miles an hour, uh, so had to be resilient in the way it was built, robust so that it wouldn't break uh, continuously. So as I mentioned, there were three key individuals in making Colossus happen. First, you ne needed to know how Tunney, the machine that Colossus was breaking, how it worked. So in order to understand how it worked, it had to be broken. There were three individuals that played the key role there. There was a linguist that noticed that two messages had been encrypted using the same key, but it wasn't the same, same ciphertext. So they were able to read the uh, two messages through a linguist. That was Tiltman. Fascinating work. Once you do that, and then you get what's called pure key. That that is combined with the plain text to give ciphertext. You give that to Bill Tut. Bill Tut analyzes the key 
he's able to derive phenomenal work how Tunney works without stealing a machine. That is a, a, an incredible piece of work. Third person is Flowers, the engineer behind building Colossus, because you needed innovation to make that happen, and quickly and fast enough so that if you are able to decrypt a message, that the intelligence that's there is still of value. So those three individuals, very important in the advent of Colossus. And Colossus was? Um, by most historians, mostly by those involved in the history of computing, they recognize Colossus as being the very first computer, although some Americans would dispute that.